Brilliant. Thanks, Charlotte. Um, welcome all, and thank you all for joining, and, and thanks, Nuffield, for the invitation to, to run this webinar today. So, so just to set the scene, if I may, uh, I spent the first 15 years of my working life farming sheep and beef on a hillside in Mid Wales, and as a direct result of my Nuffield scholarship, I came home from New Zealand with a totally different perspective. I went out and got a job within a month, and now, over 20 years later, I'm an occupational psychologist. So, I work primarily, as Charlotte says, as a freelance change agent and have a particular interest in team dynamics, leadership, personality, and change. Uh, most of that's done utilizing facilitation, coaching, and action learning, which I do a lot of. And I don't claim to be an expert, so this is my disclaimer before I start and I give all my clients. I don't claim to be an expert in anything at all or to have the answers. I'm actually much more interested in framing really good questions and enabling my clients to formulate their own answers and actions. So I thought a good place to start this seminar with, with, with a view to scene setting was uh, by looking at some models of change uh, before we move on to look at some principles of leading change and why we actually need to change at all. So the models we're about to look at aren't definitive or all-encompassing. However, they'll hopefully give us an idea of how change typ typically occurs, how we re react to it, and how best to deal with it. So we're all good, Charlotte. Everyone can hear and see and all that kind of stuff. Afternoon, Alice. So change is a loop, okay? Change is always happening. And there are differing schools of thoughts on the speed of change. So some people believe change is happening quicker now than ever. Some people believe change is happening quicker in the last 10 years than it ever had before. Some people believe that change happened quick, more change happened more quickly in the 20th century than any century previous to that. I kind of err on the other side of the school myself. I think change happens about the same speed pretty much all the time. It just seems to be happening really quickly when we're sitting in it, and now is a, you know, is a good example of that. So change models, as I say, aren't coveralls, but, but they're quite good for normalizing the process. And they can also, if we're aware of them, help us track the progress through the change, so we know where we're at in the change. And you know, we're not gonna spend a lot of time looking at this, but I fundamentally and firmly believe that change is only bad when it's imposed on us, imposed upon us. So, there's some theories they say we, we haven't got time to look into today are locus of control uh, by Rotter, where he talks about, you know, if, if we want positive change, we have to instigate it. Uh, if we want negative change, we just sit there and allow others to impose their change upon us. But that's a conversation maybe for another day or another webinar. So, but the first model of change I put in there for completion or as a good starting point is this, uh, model of change by Lewin, um, working around unfreezing where we're at, instigating and reinforcing the change, and then refreezing. So um, there's, there's still some value, some real um, truth still in Lewin's change management model, even though it's what's that, 80 years old. So, um, you know, strong change from management in the unfree stages is, is very important. Creating the need for change, maybe we probably say, well, the need is there all the time, so we don't need to create the need, or if there isn't a need, we don't need to create it. There's no point changing for change's sake. Um, lots of the later models and later research on change talks very much about that middle bit. Um, the change, change put in the middle and keeping the middle going. The middle can tend to be quite difficult. And then finally, you know, Lewin's reef freeze kind of stage would probably be less valid, less pertinent now because we don't tend to refreeze change. Once we've got it going, we keep on changing all the time. So change is a constant that needs to happen all the time. We never get there. We just keep on changing, keep on improving, keep on becoming more viable and sustainable as businesses. <laughs> now, most of you will have seen this Elizabeth Elizabeth Kubler's Ross Liz, Elizabeth Kubler Ross's model of, of bereavement. So, change through bereavement. So, she did a lot of work on on with dying with people who were dying and um, 
and also bereavement of people we've lost. So it's often useful to think of someone close to us who we've lost uh, and, and those feelings. You see on the vertical axis, high and low self-esteem and time classically along the, the horizontal axis on the bottom. So when something really bad happens, so this talk can, can be associated to change and that's why I put those sentences on, on the top is how Kubler-Ross's model fits in with change. So you use it for change. So initially when something bad happens, we feel very numb. And then we go into denial. So the, the um, self-esteem actually grows. We get, it's the self-esteem is higher because we're pretending it didn't happen. We can all think when really bad things happen, you wake up the next morning and realize again every time that it's happened. So we're denying it subconsciously. We're denying it because it's a really bad place we don't want to be in. Then you move on to the depression and then the trough at the bottom, the low self-esteem, the acceptance of reality and letting go. And that letting go is a really important part that we need to move on. It's difficult to move on because our self-esteem is low. We believe life is crap and nothing's going to work for us ever again. So it's, it's difficult. But this is a good example of where the model can help us because if we know we're in this trough, we know we need to test some stuff and move on. And, and get some small wins of building the big win so we can move forward. There's a good, a good example of, of how models can help us gauge where we are and what we need to do to get where we want to be. <clears throat> and this piece of work done using um, Kubler-Ross's his bereavement model um, to help us lead employees through change. And um, you'll see on, on this one, for, uh, for the change model, they kind of replaced. Um, they've replaced the depression, denial, depression stage with anger and bargaining. So, if you're talking about employees or teams, you get some anger because they, you know, they 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 just coming over from the denial. They don't want to move forward. They don't want the change. An element of leaders bargaining with their teams to be open the feedback and move forward and beyond the depression, which you can see here is only looking at the first half of Kubler-Ross's curve. It's only going as far as the acceptance of reality and the letting go. Uh, and, and more on that later, I think. But this is what leaders need to do to bring employees through the change and to bring their teams through the change, according to this model. So this is a, a more recent model of change called the Change House. Uh, and when we're looking at this model, we classically look at the, the top left-hand corner, the room of contentment. So teams have been very successful, have done really well, have achieved a lot. We like to sit in the room of contentment, maybe pop out under the sun deck every now and then and say, what a great team we are. You know, how, well, how, how good are we? How brilliant are we? We don't need to change. You need to carry on doing more of the same because we're there. We've made it. This is finally it. And there's some, some parallels here, if you're interested, on some work done by Janice and Mann, 1977, on groupthink. So when you get really successful groups, groupthink is a negative thing. It happens to really successful groups where they become insular, where they become arrogant, and when, where they get a feeling of invulnerability. Yeah. So they close in, they don't let any idea, outside ideas, ideas or outside people come in because they believe, you know, they have made it, they are the best, they don't need any help, they don't need to change because they've made it. And then the concept with this model is that when you're instigating change or when change needs to happen, you need to move people from the room of contentment through the room of denial and the room of confusion to the room of renewal. Yes, it's a cyclical model. So, which I know, so it's very difficult for people to move from the room of contentment, and I think it's significant that it's downwards to the room of denial because we're all sitting in the room of contentment going, we are the best, you know, let's not change anything now. Why should we? As we said, there's arrogance. Uh, there's lots of talk about details and talking about us, the team, not anything outside and ignoring the outside world. Okay. So we finally get the teams to go into the room of denial. And again, it parallels with the Kubler-Ross curve we just looked at. So denial is a factor of that. So then they go, yeah, well, it is maybe not as good as we thought. It's not our fault. Yeah. So we say, you know, they're, it's them, they're responsible. Uh, we say, yes, but a lot. And I struggle with a lot of my clients to get them to say, yes, and not yes, but. It's the circumstances. So at the moment, you know, we're probably saying, well, nothing we can do now because of coronavirus. 
12, 12 months ago, going, well, there's nothing we can do now till Brexit is sorted. What happened to Brexit? The B word disappeared totally off the map. We talked about nothing else for two years. Now we hear nothing at all of it. All we hear is the C word, not the B word. So there's a lot of finger pointing in the room of denial. There's an ejecting of prophets. There's persecution of the innocent, protection of the guilty, lots of aggression, lots of defensive behavior, because where we really want to be is back on the sun deck by the room of contentment, convincing ourselves everything is fine. So sometimes we drop out of the room of denial into the cellar of despair and come back up the stairs and drop back down again. But hopefully as leaders, we're gradually trying to move our, our teams out of the room of denial into the room of confusion. Now they can sometimes drop into the pit of paralysis and do nothing at all because they're really scared of rabbits in head like here. They don't know what's happening. But the process is to try and move them into the room of renewal. They can also sometimes go out through the revolving door of reality or even through the wrong door out of the room of confusion instead of the room of renewal. Okay? There's lots of confusion going there and the kind of typical things teams would do there was, would be uh, in the room of confusion, hire and fire, have a new strategy every day, panic, so they're all lost in the fog. This is where they bring consultants in, in large numbers, and do a lot of hiring from outside. Before, hopefully, we move into the room of renewal. So, so the things that happen in the room of renewal, where we're actually accepting the change and moving forward, is we say, let's make it happen. There's high motivation, high energy, constructive spirit, no lip service, lots of dynamism, lots of taking responsibility, lots of trust and delegation, and lots of focus on the task ahead. Okay. And, and change agents are people who you know, have written a lot of stuff in, in this field. If you superimpose the Kubler-Ross curve on this, we have um, a failing as leaders to try and move people on to the second half of the Kubler-Ross, where the rise starts coming up, where we're starting to move forward and test new things. And there's no point taking your team into the Kubler-Ross, into the room of confusion, if they're still sitting in the room of contentment denying, yeah, or the room of denial. So there's a crossover there, and if you superimpose one on the other, you have to bring the team with you. They have to realize that the change has to happen before you take them in the room of confusion. I quite like this medium because I just get to talk and no one gets to argue and I don't even know whether anyone understands any of it at all. But I'll push on regardless. So, just one last thing on this model. The irony, I guess, the irony I really like about this model, we spend all our time and energy moving people from the room of contentment to the room of denial, to the room of confusion, to the room of renewal. And then what we try and do is stop the danger is they get to the room of renewal, they do some new stuff, and all of a sudden they're back in the room of contentment or even sitting on the sun deck again. Yeah. So it's about moving in through the process, but stopping them before they slip back into the room of contentment again. So change, change happens all the time. Change management has to happen all the time. And that's one of the, the problems and the beauties uh, of leadership. So moving on a little bit to effective change leadership, just a couple of, of models and theories here. This is out of COTA 2012. Uh, anyone who's interested in reading some of this stuff, I've got the references on the end in the, in the final slide. So th the process for leading changes to establish a sense of urgency. So this is urgent, it needs to happen, or things are gonna go badly wrong or even worse. To develop a vision and strategy. So we all know it's a key, um, A key trait to effective leaders is to have a vision and have a strategy to reach the vision and to bring the teams with them. So that's the communication of the vision and the strategy. Generate short-term wins and lots of evidence there is as you go through the change to have short-term wins and to celebrate them. That might mean, you know, having a beer after work or bringing a cake or whatever, saying, this is really good, we've done this, let's celebrate it because this is the first step in the, in the new world. Uh, consolidate the gains, reduce more change. So again, this relates back to Lewin's model. It's the bit in the middle. And as does this, anchor the new approaches in the culture. This element of freezing the new approaches that is kind of frowned upon by now because it's anchoring and freezing can be dangerous because you could slip back into the, into the contentment room. So it's about keeping the change going all the time and never actually reaching the goal, just looking for new goals to reach all the time. 
Um, this is from, um, uh, uh, this is a nice little book on, on politics, politics in organizations. So the seven skills of change masters, according to Cannon and Badham. You need to have your finger on the pulse all the time, know what's happening. Um, blue sky thinking, kaleidoscope, kaleidoscope thinking. So looking, you've been really visionary and really creative in the way we think. And there's a study I really like done by IBM in 2010. You can look it up. You know, the, the one key trait the most successful organizations globally are looking for in their leaders is creativity. But in creativity, you know, that's what artists and sculptors want, surely it's creativity. We need our leaders to be creative. As leaders, we need to be creative because our main job is to have that vision, is to think, where can we be this really different? Where do we want to be in five years' time and how do we reach that? So communicating those inspiring visions, building those coalitions, getting support, com and communication is key to this all the time so the change is bottom up. Developing the dream and nurturing the team. Mastering those difficult middles. So that's, we talked about that in Lewin's models, those difficult middles. It's very, very easy to get the team to start moving and then they flounder in the middle. And I'm paraphrasing Winston Churchill here, as I'm prone to do. But I think Churchill said, if you're in the shit, keep on going. There's something, if, if you're struggling with something, don't stop. It's one you can't keep on going. And both the change models we've looked at kind of reinforce that. No good stopping in the middle, you have to keep on going because that's when the good stuff happens. And again, similar to the previous model, cele celebrating accomplishments, making everyone a hero. So note those, those little wins and, and celebrate them. So if you want one really good on managing change, th this is where I would, I would point. It's easy to read. Um, it's like a coffee book table with lots of, it's lots of theory in it, but lots of uh, little case studies as well. You can pick it up, go to the middle and find something to read for 10 minutes really useful. But if you don't like to read books or you don't want to, the key message is in the book and on the slide. Yeah. Byrne says, successful organizations constantly seek change. So if we want to succeed, we have to constantly look for change. And then what makes life interesting and keeps people like me in a job is 70% of change interventions fail. So he said, this is what you need to do, but you need to be aware that nearly three quarters of the time is not going to work. Yeah. And maybe a little more on that later. So moving on in, in the time we have, which I make about 10 minutes and maybe a little more. So why do we need to change? If, if change is difficult and we keep on failing at it, why do we need to do it at all? Why not just sit in a pocket and keep on doing what we're doing? So, um, there's something called the Red Queen Hypothesis. So those of you who are familiar with Alice in Wonderland, the Red Queen says, sometimes it takes all the running you can do just to keep in the same place. And we're all doing that, aren't we? We're going like hell and sometimes struggling to even stay in the same place. We're running faster and faster and sometimes like it, feel, it feels like we're going backwards. Um, and then for those of you who are interested in agronomy, in genetics, but also in change, there's a really good book called Chasing the Red Queen. Um, and it's around, and, and COVID is a good example of that. As much as we try to keep up with medicine, for example, COVID has mutated as, and we've got nothing to treated with, and it's still mutating now. And it's the same with agronomy, with crop science, um, also things like resistance in resistance to wormers in sheep and cattle. Yeah. Everything is changing ahead of us. We have to keep on running to keep up with it. Yeah? Or we end up with a bunch of drenches and chemicals uh, that don't work and strategies that don't work. So, so uh, it's a nice little book, uh, particularly if you're interested in that field, but you don't have to be. Just this idea that we can't stay in the same place. We have to keep on going or we'll get left behind. Yeah. And all of you be familiar with this case study. I'm not going to talk about it a lot, but we talk about don't become a Kodak. You know, Kodak were ironically built upon invention and innovation, and they went bankrupt about 10 years ago after 100, nearly 130 years of business. And it began with the decline of film photography. We stopped taking photos on film for obvious reasons, or went digital. We stopped the, posting them away to get them developed into prints. Yeah. And Kodak ironically put billions into developing that technology, but were scared of losing the core market and didn't move into it, and it killed them in the end. 
And Thomas Cook could be another really good example of that. We don't have time to kind of discuss that a lot, but where they just stuck to their core business and with this is what we're really good at. We mustn't change because people wanted to book online, not turn up in the shop, although some still do. Uh, and and a really, really one of the biggest success stories in travel and the longest running companies uh, in Thomas Cook um, are no longer with us. And unfortunately, we're going to see a lot more of that going forward with the current situation. The organisations that didn't change quickly enough um, got into more trouble than they could get out of. <clears throat> so mo most, most of the people on the webinar I've worked with before, so they'll have seen this before. Uh, it's actually not a model of change, but I use it as a model of change. It's actually a marketing model um, developed um, probably 40 years ago by the Boston Consulting Group. By the way, a lot of really good stuff from the Boston Consulting Group on LinkedIn at the moment. If you're not watching them on LinkedIn, there's lots of real nice little posts they put up there all the time. So it's a think tank based in the Midwest. They developed the model for uh, manufacturing industries in the United States. So if you were making car engines, washing machines, cars, starter motors, phones, anything at all, this is a model they developed to encourage people to get more of a market share. Yeah, so usually starts, if you look, vertical axis is market growth rate. So you're looking to get into a, into a market that's growing, or why would you be looking to get into it? And you start off with a very low relative market share, which is on the, on the right-hand side of the grid. So you've got into the market today, but you've got none of the share, but you can enter it because it's growing. So you've got a wild cat. So we've all heard of wild cats. Some people call them question marks. Some people call them problem child. You're hoping your wild cat will become a star, okay? that you get a bigger and bigger share of the market and market continues to grow. So the hope is your wild cat will become a star. Your star will become a cash cow. So we've all heard the term cash cow. But my understanding is this is where it came from originally. So the, the cash cow that's making you a lot of money without you having to work very hard at it at all. Uh, and eventually the cash cow becomes a dog. Okay. Now behind this, the next level of this is around cash flow. Okay, so we all need cash flow, we all need cash. With the wild cats, your cash flow is obviously negative. You invested a lot of money into developing it, into marketing it, maybe R and D, setting up marketing channels, setting up um, Delivery, delivery routes and all that kind of stuff. So it's negative cash flow. Becomes a star as you sell more and more of it and more and more people come back and buy more and bring their wife, their aunties, their uncles, their friends and everyone else and buy more so it becomes a star. So you get more and more of the share of this market is growing. But all markets in reality diminish over time. So there's kind of a curve like this, like a classic curve. So your star will become a cash cow as the market, can, market finish, stops growing. And as other people come in, normally uh, Asia, and make more of them more cheaply and more colors uh, with better service. So that market will diminish. And um, that's something we could argue about. But in, in reality, all markets diminish over time. The cash cow becomes a dog. Okay. So two key questions. The key question with this model is, when you've got a cash cow, something that's making you money without you having to try very hard because people are just coming and buying more and more. The supply channels are all in place. The R&D is all done. Probably don't need to market a lot because people are coming back and buying it. What should you do with the money? Because you have negative cash flow in the wildcat, negative stroke break even in the stars. In the box, the cash cow is the only, only box where you're guaranteed a substantial amount of cash coming into the business. Yeah. With the dogs, obviously, we have to get rid of them, and the, the, cash, the cash flow has, has gone again, so we have negative cash flow, we have to get rid of them. So the key to this model, and what I'd ask my clients when I go and see them, the first, one of the first questions to me in the first meeting would be, what's your wild cat? What's happening in the future? So when you have a cash cow, you need to invest some money in your wild cats, because if you haven't got a wild cat in five or 10 years, in five or 10 years, you want to have a cash cow. Because it's cyclical and all cash cows become dogs, we all have to have wild cats. We all have to have something on the horizon that will be our star and then our cash cow in future. Because if we don't, we're in trouble. We can't keep on relying on the cash cow. And a really good example, particularly in Wales, is farmers have been reliant on their single farm payment for 20, 30 years. Um, not particularly efficient in their businesses. So 90% uh, of sheep farmers in Wales are in reality losing money on their sheep. Yeah. And 
some the real savvy ones have been investing their cash cow money, i.e. their basic payment scheme, into renewables, into adding value, get involved on in the supply chain, into tourism, into property, yeah, and, and the renewables in particular. So farmers in Wales who invested some of their SFP or use it as an asset to borrow money against into renewables, turbines, uh, wind turbines, water turbines, solar, and now at the stage where that's really starting to pay the money back, and will hopefully replace the money that, that, that they lose as the subsidy diminishes. Okay. So, so that's the Boston Growth Share Matrix. So if you haven't got a well cut you, now, you want to have a cash cow in five or ten years' time. I think that's it. And finally, so I'm doing this really well on time, Charlotte, it's because no one's interrupting me, I think. Um, um, so this is a model I share with everyone in the kind of first meeting. Cold learning cycle is about how we learn. So most of you will have seen this before. So we learn stuff by experience. We go out and try stuff. Even in a classroom, we're getting a new experience. And the experience is pointless unless we reflect upon it. So as a coach and as someone who spends a lot of time in action learning sets, I believe the experience is largely worthless unless we stop afterwards and reflect upon it. What did we learn from that experience? And then how can we use that going forward, which is where the generalization or the conceptualization takes place. So we've had an experience, let's stop and reflect upon it. So in Wales it's great because we spend a lot of time driving. I spend a lot of time in my car and I use that time to reflect. And so I've been working with clients, I reflect back upon that experience. And what worked well? What didn't work so well? What do I need to do now? What would I do differently next time? So that generalizes and conceptualizes, which gives us something to test. We move on from the generalization to the testing. Next time we go on, we test it. We test something different, something slightly different. It gives us an experience, which gives us something to reflect upon. So whether we, we're trying to learn to ski or ride a bike or play a pan, piano or fly or anything at all, yeah, and even in a formal, formal situation where someone is teaching us something, that still gives us an experience that we can reflect upon. I think it's fundamental everything that we go on. We keep on testing new stuff. The faster we test new stuff and get new experiences, the more, the more experiences we get to reflect on and the faster we learn, the faster we move on. Okay. Um, I like to say a lot of my clients say, yeah, that's great, but it's just another one of your cyclical models when looks fine, we're just going round and round in bloody circles again. Okay. Uh, and we are going round and round in circles, and I, I believe in cyclical models. I think if you use cyclical models correctly, there's a circle, but it's also a spiral. So we're going round and round, but climbing up. A bit like being in a multi-story car park. So it's cyclical, but it's also, it's also developmental. And then, just a final slide there. And I think I originally saw this um, with uh, Heather Wildman. Uh, we talk a lot about opportunities. We're big believers in Nuffield in particular, but opportunities. And, you know, and the opportunities come and what we love to say is it's a great opportunity it's really really right for me but the time isn't right okay? but if we wait until the time is right what happens the opportunity is gone so we have to really grab those opportunities when they come along if the opportunity is right just go for it just grab it just do it and, and nuffield is very good at encouraging people to do that certainly has for me but don't wait until the time is right because when the time is right the opportunity will be gone. One o'clock on the dot, shall That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Wynne. I really, really appreciate that. And it's certainly um, given me a lot to think about. I am now going to unmute everybody and give us the opportunity to run through some questions. I'm also going to pause the recording